Tutankhamun is undoubtedly one of the most famous pharaohs of Egypt. Even if you don't know the name, you will recognise the mask. His tomb in the Valley of the Kings was discovered virtually intact by British archaeologist Howard Carter, his wealthy patron, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon, and their Egyptian workers on the 4th of November 1922. Carter and Lord Carnarvon had obtained the authorisation to excavate in the Valley of the Kings in 1915, but so far the results had been disappointing, yielding little in the way of evidence of a hidden tomb. A few objects bearing the name of an obscure pharaoh, Tutankhamun, had appeared on the market from time to time, and Carter remained convinced that Tutankhamun's tomb was nearby. By 1922, Howard Carter was becoming desperate. All that remained to be cleared was a small area under the remains of ancient huts, just below the entrance to the tomb of Ramses VI. This triangle between the tombs of Ramses VI, Ramses II and Meremta had been left aside because work close to these much visited tombs would have been highly unpopular during the busy tourist season. Finally, on the 4th of November 1922, at about 10 in the morning, the first traces of an entrance to a tomb were discovered. Under the supervision of Rice Ahmed Grigor, the Egyptian workmen excavated enough to expose the upper part of a plastered and sealed doorway. They had found Tutankhamun. It would take Howard Carter and his team about 10 years to excavate the tomb entirely. Obviously, for the purposes of scientific accuracy, due care and attention had to be taken, but also because a wave of Tutmania swept the globe. Even though there was very little to see, the Valley of the Kings began drawing unprecedented crowds of official visitors, persistent members of the press, as well as ordinary tourists. Carter and his team had to contend with constant pressure from those who, because of their influence, position or social connections, felt that they were entitled to a special tour of the tomb, of the lab that had been set up in the nearby tomb of Sethel II, or of both. The Queen of the Belgians, for instance, was a frequent visitor. Many of the visitors to the tomb were motivated by a morbid curiosity fueled by the rumours of an ancient curse leading to the death of anyone getting too close to Pharaoh. Lord Carnarvon himself had died in Cairo on the 5th of April 1923, and it was said that at the precise moment of his death, all the lights went out in Cairo. Very quickly, the tomb became the focus of esoteric theories and unsolicited suggestions, such as one from an American. Would it not be a gracious, a kindly thing and a very diplomatic thing to do for the British government and the Egyptian government to salute with military honours the remains and tomb of one of Egypt's rulers just discovered? The Eastern Department of the Foreign Office dismissed it with a casual external evidence would point out to his being the possessor of a weak mind. In the hope of limiting intrusions from the press, the Times was granted a monopoly of news on the discovery and would pass on the information to other newspapers after their articles had been published. For £5,000 and 75% of revenues generated by the sale of articles and photographs. It made sense from a financial and practical point of view. The agreement was modelled on that signed between the Royal Geographical Society and the Times at the time of the Everest expedition in 1921. The conditions, however, were very different. Unlike Mount Everest, Luxor was a busy tourist town with hotels, telephones and telegraph lines. This agreement with the Times, which was supposed to bring the team much needed relief from press inquiries, only resulted in alienating the international press, and in particular, the Egyptian press, naturally sensitive to the Egyptian nature of the discovery, and to the fact that it was in all respects being managed by foreigners. It was agreed that the Egyptian press should get free access to the information, but this was not enough to quell growing anger. A sort of press guerrilla started in an attempt to circumvent the Times embargo. A very international group started bombarding the excavation team with complaints and demands, canvassing the antiquity service to get fresh information, and trying to bait the Egyptian press to express their outrage more vocally. In October 1923, the Times correspondent, Arthur Merton, was officially embedded into the excavation team, but it was too late, the damage was done. Things escalated in 1924. 
the lid of the sarcophagus was to be lifted on the 12th of February and a press visit has been scheduled on the 13th. Carter requested permission to lead a private visit for the wives of his team members after the press visit. This was denied on the morning of the 13th. Carter was furious. The press visit went ahead, but Carter pinned a note in the entrance hall of the Winter Palace, at the time the best hotel in Luxor. Owing to impossible restrictions and discourses on the part of the Public Works Department and its antiquity service, he wrote, all my collaborators in protest have refused to work any further upon the scientific investigations of the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamen. I therefore am obliged to make known to the public that immediately after the press view of the tomb this morning, between 10 a.m. and noon, the tomb will be closed and no further work can be carried out. He was closing the tomb altogether, thereby launching the very first archaeological strike. Apart from the fact that it was a breach of contract, it was yet a huge error of judgment. First, he had left the upper part of the sarcophagus dangling at the end of ropes, which might have snapped at any moment. And secondly, Carter chose to ignore the change in Egyptian politics. In February 1922, Lord Allenby, the British High Commissioner in Egypt, sent Sultan Fouad a declaration to Egypt stating, the British protectorate over Egypt is terminated and Egypt is declared to be an independent sovereign state. In March that year, the Sultan was proclaimed king under the name Fouad I. In his message to the nation, the king wished that the constitutional change might be seen as the promising start of a prosperous era which shall restore to Egypt the memory of her glorious past. The discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun fostered nationalist sentiment in Egypt. Tutankhamun was instantly adopted as a unifying national symbol of geographical consistency and historical continuity. He was seen as the proof that Egyptians belonged to one of the oldest civilizations in the world. The pharaonic era was long before the arrival of the first Christians and Muslims in Egypt, so both components of Egyptian society could find in Tutankhamun the basis of a common, purely Egyptian identity. So, really, Carter and his team chose to ignore the imperialist colonial context in which Egyptology had developed as a science and couldn't, or wouldn't, understand that it was vital to shed this pre-war attitude entrenched in concepts which should have been out of date. Colonialism, elitism, scientific privilege. And so Tutankhamun, symbol of Egyptian nationalist unity, remained in Egypt. In 1972, the most dazzling artefacts found in his tomb travelled to the UK for the first blockbuster exhibition at the British Museum. In half a century, the pharaoh had lost nothing of his mystique and people queued around the clock to catch a glimpse of what Carter and his team had seen in 1922.